Okay. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to our seminar, for, to, to our web, webinar of the Catholic Academy for Communications Professionals. This is our webinar on intellectual property with, with uh, Bridget Colbert. And, and, and so uh, she is going to be telling us what you need to know as a Catholic communicator about intellectual property. She, Bridget Colbert, joined Santa Clara University as Assistant General Counsel in 2011 as part of her duties in supporting the General Counsel is providing advice to various schools of the university on intellectual property issues. She serves on the university task force as charged with re redrafting the university's intellectual property policy. And uh, she also works on revising contracts related to inter intellectual property ownership. So Bridget, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Brian. I'm really happy to be able to present to your group. As Brian said, my name is Bridget Colbert and I'm the Assistant General Counsel here at Santa Clara University. Among other things, I'm the main point of contact for the various schools and departments um, on issues related to intellectual property from copyrights to trademarks. I also did some patent work, but that's not something we're going to be discussing today, luckily. Um, so I'm going to share with you some PowerPoint slides that I've put together. Um, I've based my presentation off of questions that we anticipated um, some of you may have. At any time, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to interrupt me um, and ask your question, because that's really what I'm here for, is to answer the questions that you have. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give, um, I know that there are varying levels of expertise um, among the participants. Some people may have lots of experience in dealing with copyright issues. Some of you may have very little experience. So I want to just start with the basics. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, a copyright and a trademark automatically attaches to a work. So you don't have to register a copyright or trademark for your work to be protected. Um, I've included the examples of copyright notifications. It's the C with the circle around it. For a trademark, a TM next to a logo or a slogan, or an R for registered trademark, which would be a trademark that's registered with the federal government. Um, but again, copyrights and trademarks automatically attach. You don't have to register them. Copyright, I'm going to start talking about copyright protection. Um, it, it's attached to fixed works such as literary works, music works, dramatic works, all the way down to movies and sound recordings. Um, while copyrights automatically attach, there is one caveat that if you want to sue somebody to enforce your copyright, you have to okay. register it with the federal government. Uh, right. The duration of a copyright for works created on or after January 1st, 1978, they last for the life of the author plus 70 years. For works where you can't measure the life of the author because they're anonymous, they're created under a pseudonym, or their works made for hire, the general rule is the copyright attaches for 95 years once the work is first published or 120 years after it's created, whichever expires first. The rule is a little bit different for works created but not published or copyrighted before January 1st, 1978. And when it says not copyrighted, it means um, registered with the federal government because as we've discussed, copyrights automatically attach. So the rules are the same, but in no event will a copyright expire before December 31st, 2012. Since we've passed that date, it isn't really applicable anymore. However, if a work is published by December 31st, 2012, but was created or copyrighted before January 1st, 1978, that copyright will not expire before December 31st, 2047. Now, I'm going to talk, I'm going to narrow our focus to use of photographs, but really the next few slides can be used for anything that can be copyrighted, which is music, movies, um, literary works, magazine articles, um, but I know that many of you may have questions that are more specific to use of photographs. So that's what I'm going to use as an example here. When you want to use a photograph in any of your works, the, the rule of thumb is to make sure you have permission before you use a photograph. Whoever took the photograph is likely the holder of the copyright. And you can't use that photograph in any medium 
without having express written permission from that copyright holder. So I know that you may have questions of, what if I have an event such as a parish festival and I want to hire a photographer to come and take pictures of my event so that I can use those pictures later for say, advertising next year's event to share with the community so they can see what the festival was like this past year. I recommend always having a contract with the photographer. And the reason is it protects your use of the photographs later on. When you hire a photographer, it's not necessarily clear who would own the rights to the photographs. Although you've paid the photographer, there could be an argument that you've paid the photographer for his or her time and not for the end product. So what you want to do is make sure you have a contract with the photographer before he or she is engaged in order to ensure that the, phot the photographs are considered a work for hire, which means the photographer is working on behalf of your organization and you own the copyrights to that final work product. An example that we have here in the university is when a school and depart or a department has to get a photographer on very short notice. So they have that photographer come in, do some work and figure we'll deal with the contract after the fact. We've had an instance or two on campus where the photographer says, my fee is $2,500. So the university pays the $2,500 and then says, now give us the photographs and the photographer will say, well, if you want to use this photograph, I'll charge you $100. If you want to use this photograph, I'll charge you $50. If you want to use the photographs in this medium, the cost is this much. The university was under the impression that we own the photographs when they were taken, but the photographer is under the impression that she owns the photographs when they're taken. So we have a rule here at the university that whenever you hire a, phot a photographer, really any independent contractor for that matter, you have to make sure that you have a contract in place before you. If your photographer is a volunteer, potentially someone in your community or a parishioner who's going to be at your event or who has expertise that they would like to donate to your organization, you still need written permission to use the work product of that volunteer. Because while the volunteer volunteered his or her time and expertise, that person still owns the copyright the photographs that he or she takes. So it's important to make sure that you have express written permission from that volunteer before you use those photographs. Chances are, if it's a volunteer, they will likely allow you to use those photographs for free anyway, but it's still a best practice to make sure that you have the express written permission to use those photographs in all instances. Now, if you get a demand notice, if you've used a photograph, say for example, you've put a photo on your website, you're not a sure where that photograph came from and now you've received via email or in the mail a scary angry looking demand notice where some entity is claiming they own the rights to that photograph you're using it without permission and now they're demanding I think usually it's about $750 what we've done here at the university is first look to make sure that you have the rights to use that photograph if you don't or you can't determine whether you do immediately take that photograph down. What that likely does is cure whatever default you've had. So you fix the problem. Um, that may mean you necessarily need to pay whatever settlement demand is made of you in that original letter. So what we usually do is just take down the photograph because that should fix the problem right there. If you want to use a photograph, what you should do contact the copyright holder and simply ask permission. Same goes for literary works, videos. It, it's not as difficult as it may sound. Really what you can do is find out who owns the copyright and email that person. That's what we do here. We had an instance where one of our schools wanted to use a video that they found on, on YouTube and it was owned by The Economist, owned and produced by The Economist, and the school asked, because it's on YouTube and it's publicly available, doesn't that mean we can just use it and put it on our website? The answer is no. That video is still owned by The Economist and they've copyrighted it, which means they can determine how it's used. So what the school did is emailed The Economist and said, we really like your video, we would like to put it on our website. And The Economist emailed back and said, you may put this on your website. And that was all it took and they didn't charge us anything. Now we have that in writing, so if anybody comes back to us later and says, this is not your video and you've got it on your website, we can say, we have express written permission from the copyright holder. It was, pretty, it was pretty simple and usually it is. 
If the copyright holder says no, I do not recommend posting that video on your If you have a video, or if you have a photo in particular and you're not sure where it's from, you have the opportunity to perform a search where you can search for the image it's called the reverse image on Google. And if you go to images.google.com, you can upload the photo and Google will search the internet to see other instances in which that photograph has been used. You may be able to piece together who owns the copyright to it, but it's not the most reliable means for doing a copyright search. So we still, I still recommend following the rule of thumb that if you don't know where the photograph came from, or the video, or the music, don't use it. So another great option if you're looking for photographs that you want to be able to use for free is to go to a Creative Commons license site or Wikimedia Commons. Now, what those mean are, if I'm a photographer yeah. and I think that I've taken photographs that are so important yeah. that the population at large should be able to use them, I can have what's called a Creative Commons license. And this means that anybody can look at my photograph and read my license, and the license will say something like, anybody can use this photograph for any reason I want to share it with the world. Or anyone can use this photograph, but they need to make sure that my copyright is on it. There are multiple different types of Creative Commons and Wikimedia licenses, but the purpose of someone using those is to make their work, their photographs, publicly available. We've used Creative Commons licenses here in our Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship when we've created programs or written articles and we want the world at large to have access to those and to be able to reprint them. And what we've said is you can use this article or photograph for any reason for free, but make sure that you credit the Santa Clara University and that if you make any changes, that those changes are also subject to a Creative Commons license. I've added two websites on here where you can um, review the different types of Creative Commons or Wikimedia Commons licenses. So when you use these sites, I recommend you read the license carefully to determine what type of use you can make of the photographs or literary works or music or videos and just follow the license. But it's a way to use other people's work for free with their express written permission without even having to ask for it. Now, I know some people... Bridget, Sorry to interrupt, Paul Sukup. Uh, I notice you have a number of questions have come up in the chat thing about the photographs. So oh, you may um, want to look at that before you move to the next slide. Okay, let me see. Um, there should be something that says a little chat uh, bubble toward the bottom of your screen. Uh, let me see if I... Oh, I would have to stop sharing. Okay. Oh, oh I see that. I'm, I'm sorry. That didn't pop up for me right away. Okay. Um... Let me go up. So the first question is, what if you lend a volunteer, what if you lend a volunteer the parish photo to take the pictures, is that still a copyright issue? Oh, so if you lend somebody the parish camera to take photographs on behalf of your parish, the person who physically took the pictures is still the copyright owner because that person's creativity is what captured the image. It's not necessarily the equipment that you're actually using. It'd be the same as if you lent somebody a pen and a paper and had them write a poem, they would still own the copyrights to that poem. And if you wanted to reproduce that for your own use, you would still need to get that express written permission of the copyright holder. Um, I'm also told that I may want to express to everyone that it may be the best idea to mute your microphones during the presentation. I think some people are getting some feedback. Um, a couple of people. So here's a question. For those of us freelance photographers and writers regularly, and usually the same person, can one contract cover all, all assignments like for a particular time period, or do you suggest a contract for each individual assignment? We have that same issue here at the university. What we do is have one independent contractor agreement that says that the person is an independent contractor, which is always important because we don't want it to seem as though this person is an employee of the institution when they're not and that the contract is good for a year or a specified period of time, usually shorter than a year, because that keeps that person in the independent contractor sphere as opposed to an employee. 
And then we could say, um, add a different scope of work. So the general terms of the agreement stay the same. And every time you have a new project, just keep adding a different scope of work. So first you have somebody writing an article for your magazine. The scope of work would say this person is writing an article for our magazine. This is the topic. These are the number of words. And this is how much we're going to pay this person. And then next you want that person to photograph an event for a different publication. And you would have another scope of work that would say this person is photographing our event. They're taking this many pictures. But the underlying agreement itself says that any work created by this person under this agreement, including any scope of work, is owned by your organization. The organization owns the copyright and it was created as a work for hire. So it's really more efficient to have one contract and multiple scopes of work as opposed to many, many contracts that sometimes can get up. People can think that one project is under one contract when it's under another. So I recommend one overall independent contract and then multiple scopes of work. Okay. Um, so somebody is asking if you're screen, screen shooting some of the slides, do I give you the copyright permission to be doing this? Um, yes, I do. And also, you'll be getting a copy of these slides after the fact because I'm also going to be including a sample of a, essentially a model release for people who are going to be featured in, in um, videos or photographs that you may have in your organization. So thank you for that question. And the answer is yes. Yes. And hi, this is Brian Finnerty. So, so we will be posting the material on the Catholic Academy website. That's catholicacademy.org. So you can you can go into that later on to get the to get the slides. All right, thank you, Brian. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen so we can bring the slides back up, um, and I'm going to see if I can keep checking to see if any other questions are popping up while I'm going. Now that I'm aware that that happens, um, I know that some people had questions regarding using people's images and photographs and what you would have to have, and is that a copyright issue? or some other issue. So you, violation of copyright is using an image without consent of a copyright holder. But if you want to publish a picture where you have the copyright, but you don't have the consent of the people in the picture, that's a different matter. That could either be a violation of somebody's right to privacy or a violation of somebody's right to publicity. A violation of somebody's right to privacy is using their image without their consent. Privacy rights vary by state, but the general rule is not a violation of privacy to take someone to in an area that they would not reasonably ex expect to have privacy. So at your parish festival or at a big gathering of people, the individuals would not expect to have privacy. If you were taking a picture of somebody in their home by peering through their window, that would probably be a violation of their privacy. So I don't think that there's necessarily going to be an issue with publishing photographs that include people who have the rights to those photographs. Now, using someone's image for commercial purposes without their consent could be a violation of their right to publicity. And right to publicity, just like a right to, a right to privacy, varies from state to state. But the general rule is, if you're going to use somebody's image for commercial purposes, where that person is readily identifiable. If it's somebody very far in the background and you can't really make them out, they aren't the ones you want to worry about. But if you have a headshot of somebody where you own the copyright to the photograph, but you want to use it to endorse a product, to promote your magazine, to promote a video in some sort of promotion, the best rule of thumb is really to make sure that you have that person's express written permission to use their image in that way. Otherwise, they could they could potentially file an action claiming that you have made it seem as though they're, in, they're endorsing your product or your service when they're not. And that could be a violation to their right of publicity. But usually if you're looking at people who are in your parish, especially at, at a big gathering where you take their picture, they know it may be used in some form, you're probably okay. And likely if you use somebody's photograph and they don't want you to, the, the realistic outcome of that is they just ask you to take it down. So it's, there, it's not the biggest issue, but I still recommend that if you're going to use somebody's photograph to publicize something or promote a service or a product to get a release from that person. 
Um, and I'll discuss exactly what that looks like in just a minute. It's pretty simple. One practical point I have though, is if you're ever gonna use a picture of a minor, somebody under the age of 18, I recommend always having a release from the parent or guardian of that minor. Just because there are you know, specific sensitivities around use of photographs of minors, I just always recommend if you're going to use a photograph, get a release from the parent or guardian of that minor. I think we may have a question. Let me see. Um, so if, if you, copyright is a federal law, and this person has a question about international copyright protection. Um, this person called Ecuador to get permission to use pictures um, in a newspaper and website, and they were told yes. And, and then that person received an email that said, yes, you may use our pictures. You're probably fine. I'm not familiar with Ecuadorian copyright law, but I think that it'd probably be a hard case for them to make that you didn't have the right to use that photograph when you have an email from the copyright holder that says that you can. So I think that you've probably followed just the right procedure and it can be just that simple, sending an email or giving a call, but following up and getting it in writing is very important and I think you've done just the right thing. Okay, I think that that's the only question that we have, so I'll go back to the slides. Here is a sample of the photo, video, and voice recording release that we use at the university. Um, this will be included with the slides. This is just a sample, but you'll get a full size of it that you can read. And a release can be just this simple. It's just two paragraphs. It says, I give you the right to use this photo or recording of me in pretty, we make them as broad as possible. So um, you can use it, reuse it, publish it, sell it. Um, and you can use it in electronic form, in paper form, in any form. You can use it alone in composite. You can use it for promotion, education, and then the person will release the university from any liability resulting in distortion, blurring, altering, or, or any kind of funny thing that may happen. A lot of times, especially bigger companies, in their releases like to add things such as you will release and indemnify us in case we defame you, we slander you, um, we use your photograph or your video in a way that um, you don't like. We don't like to use that language at the university because it's, it's not fair. We're a Catholic institution. We accidentally defame somebody. We don't want to hide from liability. So this is just a sample of what we do here at the university and we make it available on my website in the general counsel's office so that anyone at the university who needs to get a release can just use this one that's been pre-approved. I think that we have another question. So this is a great question. If the school has parents sign a standard waiver for permission to use a photograph or recording of their children, is that enough, enough permission for us to use a publication to take a children's photo? Yes. Depending on what your standard release and waiver looks like, it should probably be sufficient. But you wanna make sure that that, re that release and waiver is broad enough to capture any type of use of that photograph. But if you get one at the beginning of the year that says, for this school year leading up to and including summer, the, the school can use the photograph in any way for promotion or advertising or education, um, then yeah, you should be fine. And that's a really great way to make sure that you get everyone at the same time. But you have to be careful that you make sure that every time you use a photograph that you have that parent's consent. because there is the potential that some parents do not want to sign that consent. So you just need to make sure that you can match up all the photographs you have and you want to use with all the consent. Um, the sample release that I'm including could be for an individual image. It could be for video. Usually this is attached to um, some other information about the project. Uh, for example, we had some students that wanted to participate in a video on behalf of the university for our promotional purposes. When they were given information about that, they were also given this photo and release, and so that attached essentially to that particular project. 
but you can also modify this to write the exact type of project that you're working on and what the use is going to be and how many photos you're going to use. So this is just the, the broadest release possible, but it usually does get a little bit more tailored to the particular project that they're working on. Um, is, is it sure to use photographs? So I'm not, so the question is, is it okay to use photographs from Bing, the search engine, under the license tab called public domain? I'm not familiar with that in specifically, but if a work is in the public domain, it means that there's no longer a copyright holder. So if a work that was created after 1978 and somehow there is no longer a copyright holder, although it would be the life of the author plus 70 years, but say, Say there's a photograph that was taken um, 200 years ago, which is also not likely because that wasn't something that happened. Say that somebody wrote a novel, a classic novel 400 years ago. There's no longer a copyright attached to that. The time has simply run out. So now that novel is considered in the public domain and anyone can use it for any purpose without having to get consent from anyone else. So if something is in the public domain, that means that there's no longer copyright or trademark protection and it's available to anyone to use in the world for any purpose. Um, and then we have another question. Outside publication, go to a school. So this is a really good question. Somebody wants to know if you're an outside publication and you go to a school to take photos of students, the school tells you the parents have signed a release that allows the kids to be photographed. Does that release cover the outside publication? It depends. It depends on what the release says. If the release says that the parent grants the school the rights to take these photos and to publish them and to give them to third parties for their publication, the answer is yes, that covers you. But if the release says that the school is allowed to take the photographs and use them for school purposes, or only the school is allowed to use them, then no, you would need a separate release from the parents that gives you permission to use those kids' photos in your publication. So really it depends on the language of the release and whether it extends to your organization or if it's limited to the school. So I wanna to touch briefly on the doctrine of fair use this is a very broad, expansive doctrine that could take many hours of webinar to really cover. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of it so that you understand that there are some instances in which you can use a copyrighted work without permission from the copyright holder. So the fair use principle is based on the belief that the public is entitled to freely use portions of copyrighted materials for purposes of commentary, education, and criticism. The fair use doctrine is codified in the Federal Copyright Act, and it applies to works used for, as I have here, criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Now, you can use the fair use doctrine, say you want to teach a class, and you're teaching about a particular novel. You can use little snippets of that novel, not much of it, but little portions of it, to teach about the novel, or you, a great book has come out and your publication wants to write an article about it, a review about it. Well, in order to write that review, you have to be able to discuss the work at least a little bit. And so you can take small quotes from it, you can discuss the plot, you can discuss what you think of it, and that goes towards one, news reporting, and two, criticism. Um, there are four factors that a court will weigh in looking at copyrighted work and whether it's used for fair use. And the only way that these are ever gonna come into play is if you use something and you get sued. Um, and courts look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a really expansive and amorphous doctrine. Um, but things to keep in mind are using, if you're going to use a work and try to claim fair use because you didn't get the copyright holder's permission, um, Use that work for non-commercial purposes. Nonprofit educational purposes are the easiest ones to sell, essentially. Um, use only a very small amount of that work and make sure that the type of use that you're, that you're using isn't enough to affect the market or the value of that work. Um, I'm gonna stop.
up here and look at some more of the questions that we have because I'm sure that they are before this fair use discussion. Um, okay, wow, there are quite a few. Okay, so here's a question. Um, adding to the question about an image search and the public domain, Google has this option in, in addition to Bing. I'm wondering if the person asking if we can be certain that those images are really in the public domain. Well, again, because I'm not very familiar with these tabs on Google or Bing, I can't say definitively whether you can rely on those or not. Um, but it, there may be some indication on those websites to, to, to tell you how they know they're in the public domain. Otherwise, you can still perform the Google image reverse image search to see if there's somewhere else being used that may give you an indication of if they're copyrighted. But I'm not sure if you can 100% rely on Google's or Bing's assertion that those are within the public domain. Yeah, and, and this is another question related to that. Um, that it's important to note that just because an image is available publicly, for instance, on a search engine like Bing, it doesn't automatically fall into the public domain. That's correct. Because I can take a picture and think it's wonderful and I can put it on, say, an Instagram account, if I had an Instagram account, which I don't. Um, and then if I believe if my Instagram account is public, anybody can just Google it and can find the photos that I have on there. I still own the rights to those just because they're searchable or I've posted them on the internet doesn't diminish my rights to them. It just is a way that I have chosen to display my work. Somebody else who wants to use those photographs would still need to get my express written permission before using them because I am the copyright holder even though I've posted them on some other website. Yeah. I guess my question is about uh, images uh, created by the federal government, uh, whether it's the White House press photographer or, um, you know, a, a Navy photographer that's photographing a, um, like a, a natural disaster or something like that. Uh, how, how, how can we use those images and, and do we have to actually credit those images um, if they're in the public? That's a really great question. My, my understanding is that those photographs are copyrighted by the entity that took them. So I think the White House um, photographer, uh, while he takes those pictures, it's his job. So those are all work for hire, I believe. But either he owns the copyrights to them or the White House or even the federal government owns the rights to them. So I think that in those instances, you would still need to get permission from the copyright holder to, to, use those, to use those photographs publicly. Um, I'm not sure how you would get those rights, but I bet you could Google it and find at least from the White House how to get access um, to the copyright holder. But I think even if the Navy is taking those pictures, although they're government entities, I think that the government itself owns the copyrights and you'd still need to get express written permission to duplicate those. Okay. One thing to keep in mind is the government may be particularly best suited to know if someone is using their photographs without copyright. So I'd be really vigilant to make sure that you're not using any government photographs that are copyrighted without their permission because they'd probably be able to find out more quickly than a smaller entity. Yeah, I guess I was working under the impression that any, any image, photograph, uh, work that was created by a federal employee while in, while in the middle of their duties uh, as a federal employee automatically transfers into the public domain. I, I'm not sure that that may be correct. Um, I would have to look that up to see, but if, it's, if somebody's taking photographs as part of their job, then the, that would be considered a work for hire and the copyright would automatically go to the employer. So, if it doesn't become a, a public domain work, which again, I'm not sure if it does, I'm not familiar. Um, if it doesn't, then it's owned by whichever federal government branch or entity um, employed the person who took the photographs. Which goes right into this question that I received here um, from Brian. If an employee takes a photo for us, does our organization own those photos without a specific co contract covering that point? 
It depends. If that person is a photographer that you've employed and is your employee and that person's job is to take photographs for your institution, the answer is yes. That would be considered a work for hire because it's within the scope and duties of that person's employment, which means that your organization would own the copyrights. The, the purpose of that person's employment is to do this work for you, which means that those photographs are being taken on your organization's behalf and your organization owns the copyrights. If it's somebody who, say, is a teacher at your school, but also took some photographs of an event not related to that person's teaching, then that may be more like a volunteer assignment where that person would own the copyrights. So if somebody is taking photographs within the course and scope of their employment, then your organization would own the copyrights outright. Um, so a question about fair use, does using a screenshot of a video for an image on a website constitute fair use of that video? It depends on the purpose of the use. If the use is for nonprofit, educational, commentary, or criticism purposes, then probably yes, it would be considered fair use. If you're using that, that screenshot to promote something, or you're using it to let people know about, about the fact that the video exists, Probably not. That may be considered violating the copyrights to that video. So even though it's a very small portion, you need to make sure that your use of that screenshot is, falls within the categories that are permitted under fair use, like criticism, commentary, parody, um, scholarship, research, teaching, things that are for a public benefit. Um, here's another question about photographs. Um, So if somebody takes a photograph that's used in a newspaper story, um, what is the scope of the rights that you've conceded? It depends on what kind of agreement you have with the newspaper. If a newspaper says, I want to do a story on your event, can you send me some photographs? And you do, you would still probably want to have some sort of agreement with that newspaper saying, you can use this photograph, but you can't give it to someone else. The issue here is because you're giving it to a newspaper or another publication, that that use may fall under fair use. So if I take a photograph of my event and it's published in our local newspaper, the San Jose Mercury News, and they do an entire article about how great our event is, and then another newspaper wants to also talk about our event, using that photograph potentially could be considered fair use but I would still make sure that you have some sort of agreement or limitation on the rights you're granting to the first newspaper to say, you can use this, you can't give it to anyone else, this is not considered fair use, I'm giving this to you, I'm giving you rights under the copyright law, um, then you may be able to have some sort of claim against the other publication or book or something else that's using your photograph without your permission, especially if your photograph is being used to promote something and is not being used um, to describe your event, then I would say you did not give up those rights to this other third party publication to use your, uh, your photograph to promote something. You only gave your photograph to this one newspaper to discuss your event or to discuss whatever the purpose of the photograph is. Um, let me see. So, um, so someone has a question, they just joined, and they want to know if news organizations have special rights like fair use. The answer is yes. Um, news reporting is a specific category under fair use, but they're still constrained by the four factors of fair use about not using a work to promote something, using just a limited portion of it only for the purpose of whatever, the, of, of news reporting in that instance. So yes, newspapers do have um, rights under fair use, but it's constrained just like it is for everyone else. So while we're talking about photography right now, everything that we've discussed can also be used for um, videos, music, literary works, plays, choreography, anything that's written in fixed form. A lot of the questions that Brian um, thought might be asked early on had to do with photographs. So I'm, I'm tailoring this discussion to photographs, but 
anything that we've discussed here also can be used for other, other works, except for the release. That's really for people being in a photograph. But fair use applies to everything that the copyright law applies to. Um, the copyrights, you can't use somebody's novel without their permission. You can't use somebody's poem without their permission. We've, I've, I've advised an entity on an issue where one of their people kept posting this really great poem on the website and they wanted to use it to create community discussions and to um, bring it back to scripture teaching, which was a great idea. The problem was this person didn't have the copyrights to use that poem. And the poem author and copyright holder found out about it. So we received a letter to take it down. We took it down. Then another person in the same organization thought the poem was great and essentially did the same thing. That second time it was used, we ended up having to pay for that use. And we had to pay a penalty because we did it once and we were told to take it down, which we did. But then we did it again, which almost shows a bad faith intentional violation of that copyright. So we had to pay. And then we took it down. And then it was used a third time and we had to pay a little bit more. And luckily, I think that the organization has gotten the message not to use this poem or any copyrighted material without the express written consent of the copyright holder. But that's just something to be aware of that these, these copyright laws surrounding photographs also apply to other fixed literary um, musical um, contemporary works. Okay, we've gotten a lot of questions. So, um, If you hire someone to take photographs and they sign an agreement to give you copyright permission, you still need to include their name. It, it depends on what that permission says. If you hire someone to take photographs and they say, I give you the right to use these photographs in any way, I assign to you any rights that I have, and they don't say you have to credit them, you probably don't have to. But if the agreement says, I assign you all the rights, but you still need to credit me, then you do need to credit that person. But that's probably something that's good to have worked out before the agreement is signed. If somebody assigns a copyright to you, then you are the copyright holder, then there is no other person to credit. You own the copyrights. You don't need to credit the person who took the work because they don't own the copyrights anymore. Okay, here's another question. Um, regarding BMI music. So if a diocese purchases permissions under BMI, can the parish and schools in the diocese use the music there? Can youth ministers? So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about copyrighted music in just a moment. So I'll come back to this question because I'm going to be talking about BMI and ASCAP as well. So hold on to that question. Um, another question we have here about fair use. Is it fair use to use for a news organization to use a Facebook profile picture of a person mentioned in a news story, a victim of a crime? Um, I would not use photos of a victim of a crime without getting that person's consent um, because that's a pretty touchy subject. If there is a Facebook photo that's publicly available, it's still owned by the person that took that photograph. So if you use their Facebook photo um, and you're a news organization and you're discussing that person, let's say it's the perpetrator of a crime who tends to have fewer rights than a victim of a crime. If there's a perpetrator of a crime and you want to write a news article about that person and the crime and you are able to find that person's profile picture on Facebook and you're able to download it, you can probably make a pretty compelling argument that your use is fair use because you're using it for news reporting. So if somebody is receiving services from ministries such as a food pantry, do they need to get to give permission to be photographed by a news organization? If there's say a long line of people you have because you're having a Thanksgiving food drive, and you have a long line of people that are coming to pick up uh, the donations um, and there's a news organization there, you, you're probably not going to be in any trouble if that person's photograph or video is taken because it's the news organization that's doing it. So it would be the news organization that would need to receive um, the permission from the person being photographed or videoed. If it's inside the building and you have a small building and these people don't want to be on the news because they don't want people to know their plight and that they're receiving these donations, um, you, it's probably a best practice to keep 
any news organization outside of the building because you have more control of what happens inside your building than outside of your building. And if, if a news organization wants to photograph inside your building, then I would recommend that news organization come prepared with a bunch of release um, and waiver agreements that those people can sign. So that it, it depends on how much control you have over the space, but I would say to try to, to try to maintain as much control as you can inside your building, but there's really not much you can do outside of your building. Okay, so then I have another question about music, so I'm gonna go back to music. Um, so using copyrighted music is something to be particularly vigilant about because the music industry is very litigious and aggressive when it comes to enforcing their copyrights. And that stems from Napster essentially making it so easy to share music files that anybody could get any music they want for free and they could download it and save it and they don't have to buy these songs anymore. So the music industry lobbied, they got the DMCA passed and they got all these bills and laws and they also have a lot of money to just troll the internet and see if somebody is using music without a copyright. So I recommend that you always secure permission to the copyright holder before you use songs. I have here in mass media, because if, you, if you're performing a song at a small gathering, the chance of the copyright holder finding out are pretty slim. But if you have a video, um, a, some sort of song that you want to incorporate in a video, you want to post on your website, you want to make a commercial out of, it's likely that the copyright holder will find out. So I recommend always getting written permission from the copyright holder. And it's very unlikely that you'll get that permission for free. So you're probably going to need to pay for it. You may be able to use copyrighted music. Um, under the fair use doctrine, but it's important to only use as much of that music as you absolutely have to. The smaller amount, the better. I advised one Catholic publication on an issue directly related to this. They had a wonderful idea to post um, popular songs on their website along with scripture reading and then um, have conversations and criticism about the song and the scripture and sort of juxtaposing contemporary music with traditional writing and how they can work together and what we as a community can, community can learn from them, which was an excellent idea. The problem is they can't post the entire song without getting written permission from the copyright holder. That wasn't considered fair use because they wanted to put the entire work on their website. We discussed the option of using very small portions of the work, but it can't be like the, it can't be the main, the main heart of the song. It could be, say, half of the first verse, part of the middle of the song. It can't be the first half of the song. That would not fly under fair use because you're using too much of it. Unfortunately, in that instance, it didn't work out. Their project wouldn't have worked very well to only use a small part of the music, so they weren't able to do it. Then they thought, what if we just reproduce the, the song lyrics and not actually write, have the song available for listening? but it's the same whether you post the song in a, a recording form or you write the lyrics, it's all copyrighted. And if you wanna use it under fair use, you have to use a small portion of it. And it has to be for criticism, education, news reporting, commentary purposes. Now, if you want to use music and you want to display it publicly and it's um, usually the issue is gonna come up with popular music, but it's still under copyright, then there are a couple of organizations who sort of have batches of copyrights that they can sell to you, almost like a subscription. One is BMI, the other is ASCAP. I know that we use those here at the university for our Center for the Performing Arts and our Department of Music and Dance. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with how exactly those work, but that'd be something to look into if you want to use music more often. You can get batches of copyrights and you can pick from the songs and it's going to be more cost effective but it's still <laughs> expensive to use copyrighted music that was the problem we had with the organization that i was advising it was too expensive to get copyrights to these songs for their purposes because they were a small organization if your organization is bigger and has more resources it may be good to look into either bmi or ascap to determine if you can get greater batches of um, copyrights for music. Okay, so now let me see what other questions we had. 
I hope I answered the BMI um, question. So the, the, the question that came up was, if a DMI purchases um, permissions under, if a diocese purchases permissions under BMI, can the parish and schools use those? Well, it depends on what the BMI license says. Here at the university, we have a BMI license that's specific to certain departments. Only they can use music and only under certain circumstances and they can't change lyrics and they can't alter the music. But if my office for some reason wanted to use music and post it on our website, we would not be able to do that under the current licenses that we have with BMI and ASCAP. So I recommend that the diocese look at the permission that they have from BMI and if it's only for the diocese, the diocese office, then it probably is not permitted for a, per, for a parish or the youth ministers to use it. But if the permission is for the diocese at large or the diocese and um, all related entities, then you may be okay. So I recommend reading the license carefully. And if you need to, going back to BMI and seeing if you can negotiate for a wider license, it may cost a little bit more, but it may be more cost effective in the long run. Um, okay, so here um, somebody has a question about the use of composed music to accommodate different lyrics than the original, <clears throat> which prayer, prayer groups do frequently. So if you have a small prayer group and they're using music and changing the lyrics, the chances of a copyright holder finding out are probably pretty slim, so you're probably okay there. But if, say, you have, um, if you have the composed music itself, because it's probably written down, that in and of itself is copyrighted. If you want to make up your own lyrics and you have, you, you purchased the, the sheet music, so you have the right to perform it, um, probably not in a giant public space, but in church, say you have um, a great church song and you've purchased the sheet music, the, the copyright holder knows that the reason you purchase that is to perform it in your church. So you probably have the rights to do that. And if you want to change the lyrics, I would say that's probably fine, um, especially if you're doing it in, in a small group um, or if somebody wants to write new lyrics to it. As long as you have permission to use the underlying music, you could, you could change it. You could add new lyrics. Um, that, should, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, um, so here's a question about broadcasting daily mass um, to a local cable access center and the internet. During communion, we have a, a variety of rotating CDs from various artists. We play one to two minutes during communion each day. Are we violating copyright? Probably yes, because you're using copyrighted music um, on, a, on a large scale that's being shown to local, local people and it's available on the internet. So theoretically, everybody in the world has access to it. I would recommend getting um, authorization from the copyright holders before you do that because you're publicly performing and displaying um, what would very likely be copyrighted work and you're making it publicly available. Um, one thing to consider though is just because you bought a CD, all you have rights to is that CD for your personal use. You don't have the rights to publicly display it. That's a right that's um, that's kept and held by the copyright holder. So I recommend in that instance to try to get some release or express permission to use the music on those CDs. Um, because it's being used in master and communion, it's probably not being discussed or criticized or used for teaching. So it probably would not fall under the fair use doctrine. So I recommend getting the rights to use whatever music you're going to use um, because it's going to be available on the Cable Access Center and on the website. Um, we have another question about photographs. If photos are taken by our diocese news organization for news purposes, but then those photos are repurposed for posters and collateral materials for our annual appeal, would releases then be necessary for all subjects in the photo um, or only those that are identifiable? Um, I would say yes if there, if if the photographs are going to be used for an annual appeal, which would be a promotional purpose, I recommend having people who are easily identifiable in those photos sign a release. Again, probably the worst thing that's going to happen is someone would say, I didn't consent to this. I want you to take it down, which you could. 
but it's probably best, especially when you're considering from a public relations standpoint and community building, to get the releases beforehand before you potentially upset someone who doesn't want to have their photograph used. Um, so this is another question about fair use. Some television broadcast journalists say fair use for popular music allows up to 15 seconds to be played over the air without being liable. Have you heard this? Is it a good rule? I have heard this. I don't believe it's a good rule. There have been lots and lots of court, federal court cases about fair use. And the one thing that the court doesn't want to do is come up with hard and fast rules. Say, you can use a song, but only 15 seconds of it. Or you can use a song, um, but only the very middle of it and not the beginning and not the end. They intentionally don't want to set those hard rules because they want fair use to be an amorphous, expansive doctrine that can be applied in various circumstances, but that isn't necessarily nailed down because fair use is such a case-by-case -case analysis. So I would say I, I don't recommend using this 15 seconds as a rule of thumb um, because the courts have specifically declined to put such a rule in place. Um, so a question, how does music copyright apply when the assembly is singing during a live streaming of a mass or other liturgical celebration? Um, if you have the, say, the, the missiles and they've got all the music in there, um, chances are the copyright holder understands that they're going to be sung at mass. Just because it's live streamed probably doesn't change that assumption. So I would say you're probably okay but there is the potential that some litigious copyright holder could come to you and say, you have the rights to use this song in your liturgy, but not to make it publicly available on the internet. So that's really a risk that I think that your church should weigh, um, whether they want to try to get permission to do that from the copyright holder or go ahead and do it anyway and sort of see what happens. It really depends on the level of comfort of um, your diocese risk manager or of your parish and, and what they want to do. But there's the potential that could be a violation of copyright, but it's, there's also the potential that it's not. So that, that's probably something to discuss, um, maybe even with your diocese council to see what that person recommends. Um, okay, here's a question about a newspaper. If we as a newspaper take pictures at a parish festival, then use them in the paper, as you talked about, are we free to post them indefinitely along with the story to our newspaper's website? Yes. The newspaper who took those photographs owns the copyright. So you can pretty much do with them what you would like. Um, if you're going to use them for promotional purposes outside of news reporting, I recommend getting releases from people who are easily identifiable. Um, but because your organization took those photographs and owns the copyrights to them, you can use them in any way that you would prefer and for as long as you would like. Um, so here's a question about describing situations where synchronization rights are needed for the use of music and how they differ from other rights. I don't quite understand that question. So if P. Garcia could um, maybe try to explain what you mean by synchronization rights, it may just be a part of the law that I'm not familiar with. Um, but if you can give me a little more information, I may be able to have an answer for you or to find one after the end of our session. Um, I took a screen grab of you. Is it okay if we use it in the Catholic Academy newspaper? I'm not gonna lie, this isn't the best lighting and I don't think it's terribly flattering, but that's fine. Um, if you'd like, I can send you a much more flattering picture, but yeah, please feel free to use the video of this or any screen grabs in any way that you want. I have no problem with that. Um, so here's a question. I have seen posters displayed at large events, at large events warning that audio, video, and photographs will be taken and used for publicity. Enter implies consent to be photographed. Does this cover the permissions to use a photo, video, audio? Yes, it probably does. It's not 100% fail safe because you have to make sure that those posters are large enough and conspicuous enough that everybody who enters can see them and read them and understand them. But I would say that that's not the that's, it's a pretty good way to get around having to get releases from everyone, but I would make sure that you have clear documentation and evidence that you had these posters up, that they were there for the duration of your event, and that they were large and easy for everyone to see. 
That way, when someone walks in, they know that their picture is going to be taken and used potentially for promotional purposes. So yes, this is a good workaround having to track down everybody um, who's in your gathering to get their releases. But one thing to keep in mind is not everyone is actually going to see this. And if their picture is taken they, and used in a promotional way, they may not be happy and they may not like that. So if you're worried about the effect that this may have on your community, um, I still recommend trying to get releases from people just as um, almost an offering of goodwill to show that you're not trying to pull one over on anyone. Because sometimes when people see these big um, signs. They think big corporations are, are going to use my photograph. Um, so if your event is more of a community-based event and more about community building, I recommend still trying to get releases, but it's not, not necessary in this instance. Oh, here's a, here's a great question from Ryan. What type of release would you use for kids camp so we can use the photos for a camp brochure or a camp website? A standard release sounds so broad, parents would be scared to never sign it. Um, I have personal experience with this because my son goes to the kids on campus daycare here at Santa Clara and they gave me a release to use his photograph that I thought was broad and I didn't like it. So I made a bunch of changes to it. Being a university attorney, now those changes course apply to everyone because I rewrote their form. Um, but I recommend that if you have a kids camp that you try to use a release that's a little bit more narrowly tailored. The release that I have as an example in your slides and that you'll receive later on is really broad. But you can tailor that, you can tailor the language. You can essentially keep it the same but say we will only use these photos for these reasons and in these circumstances. Um, so yeah, if you're going to be using photographs of kids from one of your kids' camps or any other kid gathering, I recommend trying to tailor down those releases to show, um, to give the parents a really good understanding of how you intend to use those photographs. You're going to be limiting yourself because you won't be able to use those photographs for, say, giant appeals that you're going to have, or you may not be putting them on commercials or on the side of a bus. Um, but I recommend trying to be as specific as possible with releases for minors so that the parents have really good notice of how you're going to use those photographs and how you're not going to use those photographs. Okay, um, here's the clarification that I needed for synchronization rights. Um, apply when you're using music with video, perhaps in producing a video message or a PSA. <laughs> so if you're going to be creating a video and you want to use music to go with that video, um, what I recommend you do is you get the copyright permission from the holder of the music and you let that person know that you're going to use it for this video. Because that person may say, you can use my music on your website as a standalone page, but I don't want you using it in conjunction with anything else because that implies that the person who holds the copyright endorses your video. So I would say for synchronization rights, make sure that the copyright permission you have to use that music specifically states that you're going to use it with the video and you may be required to show the copyright holder the video beforehand to make sure that that person is comfortable with the use of his or her music in that instance. Um, but you also want to make sure that you own the copyrights to the video as well and if you're using a video that's owned by someone else and music owned by someone else, I recommend doing the same for both. Making sure that the video owner understands that you want to pair it with this music and that that's okay, and that the music owner understands you want to pair it with this video, and that that's okay. So you may need two different consents from two different entities that agree that you can use both works together. If you take a photo of an employee and you want to use that for promotional purposes, yes, you still need a consent and release because you're using it for promotional purposes. Um, even though that person is your employee, you don't own their rights to publicity, which means that even if your person absolutely loves your organization and you think she would have no problem having her picture shown on our commercial, she may not want to be put on a commercial. So you would still need to get her to sign a release and waiver saying that she consents to your, her, your use of her photograph in that instance because she still owns her rights to publicity. Okay, and now I'm, I'm out of time. Um, I, I have a couple of notes on proprietary marks. Just don't use a company's 
um, logo without their permission and try to make sure that other people don't use your logo without your permission. Um, but that's a really small sort of aside that's this last slide. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to send me an email. I did not include my email on the slides. I apologize, but it's bcolvair at scu.edu. If you Google my name, I think it pops up on the Santa Clara website. So thank you so much for your time and for letting me come um, speak to you. I really appreciate it. And um, I look forward to potentially coming back and speaking to you again in the future. And Bridget, thank you so much. I, I think this was a very popular session and you can see that we had tons of questions and it looks like people still have tons of questions. So, so thank you very much. This has been a webinar of the Catholic Academy. We'll, we'll be posting a link to it on our website, catholicacademy.org. This is Brian Finnerty of the U.S. Communications Office of Opus Dei and a board member for the Catholic Academy. Thank, thank you all very much.